Welcome everyone to our webinar today titled NACO Local Government Heavy Vehicle Route Assessment Guidelines Geometric Assessment Part 1. Next slide please. My name is Isabella and I am moderating the session today. Next slide please. We plan to go for 60 minutes with time for questions. Next slide please. We'd love to have your input so you, you see here on the slide how to send your questions through. Now we're following the government guidelines and all coming from our home offices. So fingers crossed today, all our technology works. And we also have Neva and Rosie from ARRB joining in today for tech support. Next slide, please. Our presenter today is Kieran Hay, Senior Professional Engineer, Transport Safety, ARRB. Next slide, please. And we also have two guest presenters today who are available for questions throughout. They are David Milley, Team Leader, Transport Safety, ARRB, and Larry Griffiths, Principal Engineer, Road Manager Policy, Heavy Vehicles and Prosecution Department of Transport and Main Roads. Okay, let's get started and we'll be hearing from Kieran first. Thanks, Isabella. Great to be here again. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us for the third session of our uh, webinar series. Uh, so, as I'm sure many of you know already, uh, this is a five-part webinar series and we're up to the uh, third part and we're starting to get into a bit more of the uh, technical side of the guides now. Um, so, as you can see in this table here, uh, we've actually split the geometric assessment side of the guidelines across two different uh, sessions. There's just a lot of content to cover, um, so we thought it was best to do that rather than uh, drawing out the length of the webinar itself. Uh, so this, this webinar will be covering the first half of the geometric assessment part of the guideline. Um, and we also have two examples, which we'll be looking at at the end of the uh, slide package, uh, which is geometric assessment of the road. And then also looking at some risk assessment uh, of some deficiencies that are identified in those uh, route assessments. Uh, so again, we, we just have this table, well, this page here, which shows a quick overview of what sections of the guidelines will be covered in this webinar session. And uh, each of these sections has new guidance in them that, compared to the other or existing guides. Uh, so during this webinar, we'll be touching on each of these sections. Um, so the main sections we'll be looking at are formation widths on straight sections of roads, uh, operating conditions for low volume roads with reduced widths, uh, formation widths over structures and horizontal alignment. And the key ad additions that have been covered, uh, that have been included that we're gonna cover, are uh, formation widths on lower order roads. So that's uh, low volume, low speed, specifically around local government areas. Um, Formation widths on uh, rural unsealed roads. So unsealed roads is uh, typically a topic that hasn't been covered much in, um, in existing guidelines. And then also um, looking at uh, assessing heavy vehicle rollover. Uh, so that's more around the horizontal alignment sec uh, side of this. So to assist users in their route assessments, uh, we've developed a flowchart that describes the assessment process based on the road area. So this includes your mid blocks, intersections and rail crossings. So they're the three main sections that we've identified. Uh, and in the flowchart there, you can kind of see which sections of the guide um, are, are required to be assessed for each of those road, uh, road areas. Um, so an easy one, I suppose, is rail crossings where it's mainly just those controls and stacking distances that need to be uh, assessed. Uh, so overall, this is just aimed at helping to streamline the process for users of this guideline. Um, that way, if they're only assessing mid blocks, they only really need to look at the areas that are included in that mid block section. Uh, so throughout this session, we'll be looking at, uh, we'll only be looking at sections of the guide which have new or updated guidance in comparison to old or existing guides. Uh, this means a lot of areas in the guides uh, won't be covered or won't be covered in a lot of detail. Um, so it's, it's mainly just looking at uh, new content really. Yeah. 
And um, I guess this is this is just another part of that uh, flow chart that's been highlighted here. So it's basically um, yeah, determining if each attribute meets the guide and then working out what to do from there. So if it passes, obviously you don't really have to do anything else, but if it fails, then you can move on to either mitigating treatments that are already included in the guide, or you can move on to a risk assessment process where you come up with your own mitigating treatments if possible. All right, so the first area that we're gonna be looking at is um, mainly around formation widths on straight sections. And, and this part here is actually looking at uh, turn lanes and curbside lane widths. Uh, so this is assessing if a heavy vehicle is likely to strike a roadside object that is past the shy line of the road. Uh, so we've got a diagram there on the right, and this is included in the guideline as well, um, which kind of just shows what the shy line is, where, where it's located on the road, and I guess um, how that'll affect uh, vehicles traveling on that road. Um, so this is mainly looking at the cross fall of the road, and uh, the, the lane widths themselves. Um, and it's basically using those two values to determine if a, if a vehicle's load would cross that shy line and then possibly strike an object. And you can see in the diagram there that um, using like a 3% cross ball, not so much of an issue in that circumstance, but then with a 5% or greater, um, because that vehicle ends up on a bit more of a lean, there is that um, chance of that vehicle actually hitting an object that could be next to the road. Um, so this table at the bottom right there, so that's the table from the guide. Uh, and it's basically just showing how to calculate that. It's very similar to a lot of the other tables that we've shown previously. Um, you're just looking at through lanes, turn lanes, what the width is, and then also what the cross ball of that road is. So that's, that's a pretty straightforward one. Uh, the next section is looking at the actual formation widths on straight sections of, uh, I guess, rural roads. Uh, so this section has received a lot of new, con uh, new guidance and new content to assist local governments in um, assessing their uh, road networks. Uh, so it includes a, a new dissection of speed into two ranges. Um, so we've now got a 60 to 70 kilometer uh, range and then an 80 to 100 kilometer range. Um, so the, the new speed range accounts for reduced tracking width at lower speeds and is provided as it is recognized that local government roads tend to have lower speeds and also narrower road widths. Um, so later on, we'll, we'll go through a couple of um, short examples, which kind of shows how to calculate the recommended formation widths. Um, and then at the end of the session, we'll also look at a bit of a in-depth example of uh, how to determine formation widths and I guess what to do if, um, uh, if it doesn't meet the recommended guidance that's shown in the guidelines. Um, and just as a note on this slide here, um, this slide only goes up to the 500 AADT range, but the guideline does go greater. Um, it's just if we tried to add in all the information, it would be a little bit squashed and you wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, so just as a bit of a side note on that one. So the next two slides will just be uh, some quick examples of how to use um, the, the tables in the guideline and, and how to assess the formation width of a sealed rural road and also an unsealed rural road. Uh, so this one here, this is a sealed rural road and uh, we're just gonna use some sample data which is shown in that blue box on the bottom left there. Um, and using this data, we can assess to find our recommended seal and carriageway widths. Um, so it's a relatively easy process. Uh, again, it's just using those, those simple tables and um, matching up the, the, requir the required criteria. Um, so in this case, you know, we're gonna look at a type two road train um, on an undivided carriageway or two-way road, and our speed is 70 kilometers per hour. Um, so when we just plug that information directly into the into the table on the right there, um, we have 
because this is a sealed road, we have to look at both the sealed width and the carriageway width. Um, so the sealed width is in the green there, uh, and it's saying that you need 6.1 meters of sealed width. And then in the blue, uh, it's saying carriageway width, which needs to be 8.2 meters. Um, and it's as simple as that. And then it's basically just checking to see if whatever road you have or whatever road you're assessing um, is greater than that value. And if it is, then that's fantastic, it passes. Um, if it isn't, then there is some mitigating treatments that we can uh, look at as we go through these slides um, or a risk assessment process can be used. Um, so as I mentioned just before, the guideline can be used to determine the formation width required for uh, an unsealed road as well. Um, so typically that's something that hasn't really been, uh, I guess, used very much in the past or hasn't been conveyed very well in the past. Um, so this is just another quick example of, of how to assess that width um, using unsealed rural roads. Uh, so again, we've just got some sample data in there shown in the blue box on the bottom left. Um, and then we're just going to use that data to, to work out what our recommended carriageway width is. Um, so because this is an unsealed road, it obviously doesn't have any seal width. So we just look at that carriageway width. Um, and in this case, uh, we're, we're now looking at B doubles uh, for 80 kilometres instead of um, uh, road trains at uh, 70. Uh, so we can now see that our recommended carriageway width is 7.9 metres. And again, uh, it's as simple as checking your route, seeing what the actual width of your road is and comparing that against this 7.9 metre value. Um, if it passes, fantastic. If not, yeah, we can look at mitigating treatments or a risk assessment process. And um, as I mentioned before, we'll be looking at a bit more of an example later on at the, uh, towards the end or, or mid section of the, um, of the presentation. So these are some of the, um, I guess, additional assessments or, or mitigating treatments that we mentioned before. Um, so if you're doing a route assessment, and your route doesn't meet those uh, requirements in the previous tables, uh, then we can start looking at these additional assessments. So this one's looking at rural roads um, where there's a low volume or low speed. Um, so that's less than 75 VPD, so vehicles per day, or AADT or average annual daily traffic. Um, and also when the speed is less than 60 kilometers per hour. Um, so this is additional guidance specifically around that. Um, so this is more common in local government areas where narrow widths are provided due to um, reduced risks uh, with low volumes and low speeds. Um, so these values are also dependent on the available stopping, dis uh, stopping site distance along the road. Um, so that is a, an extra thing that does have to actually be measured for this type of um, assessment. Um, and we, we will see more of this towards the end of the session when we look at the examples, but um, essentially it's saying that if there are roads that have low speeds, low volumes and have a reasonable sight distance, then it is possible to actually put those vehicles on the roads using uh, reduced widths as the risk isn't as high as um, a road that has a higher volume or a higher speed. And again, this guideline is all about, uh, I suppose, a risk-based approach to providing access. So on top of that last slide, uh, further guidance is provided for rural roads that have extremely narrow sections of road for short distances. Um, it has been recognised that on low volume rural roads, it is likely that there will be narrow sections. Um, as such, this guide only applies, um, or this, this um, section of the guide, I should say, 
only applies for roads with low volumes, less than 150 uh, vehicles per day or AADT. Um, so this is, this is to provide the ability to rationalize the decision-making process based on the potential risk. Um, so obviously with roads that have very low volumes, there is going to be less risk of an, of an event occurring. Um, and this kind of um, makes use of that fact. Um, and again, uh, narrow sections should not result in access being denied, but should be rationalized based on risk. And we'll talk more about that in this table here. Um, so this table provides the guidance for those short sections of narrow roads that we were talking about just before. Um, so as an example of this, um, just, there we go. Um, so as an example of this, if we had a road that did not meet any of the previous criteria, uh, then we could look at this table, assuming that it, it did meet the uh, traffic volume requirements. Um, so if we assume that we have a, a road and the BPD or AADT is less than 75, uh, then we can have a section of road that could be no less than 3.5 metres wide uh, for a maximum length of 100 metres. Um, so that's, that's shown there in that table. However, to, to go along with that, there are also some criteria that we have to meet. Um, so we can't have concurrent sections of narrow length within certain distances of each other. Um, we must meet certain site distance requirements and um, the combined length of sections. Uh, so no more than 10% of the road length being assessed can be uh, that of a shorter, uh, of a narrower width, sorry. Um, so there is quite a significant amount of guidance around um, you know, rural roads and also these narrow sections of roads. Um, And then to go along with those narrow sections of roads, there's also um, operating conditions that have been added into the guidelines. Um, so this only applies when you're using some of those um, uh, sections, but, uh, sorry. Uh, so this only applies when we're using those narrow sections of roads that we just saw before. So anything that is in this table here, um, these, uh, these criteria would apply to that. Um, so these operating conditions can be applied to mitigate other attributes that have not met the guidelines. Um, for example, reduced operating speeds through sections with substandard curvature or, or a section with reduced sight lines. So you can still use some of these um, mitigating treatments for not just narrow sections, but also other areas. And we've provided some guidelines um, or some operating conditions in the guidelines already. However, there are additional guidelines, uh, sorry, there are additional operating conditions that can be uh, imposed by local governments that may not be um, presented in the guide itself. Uh, again, it's, it's a bit of a risk-based structure. So um, if the local government is happy with providing a different approach, that they believe will reduce the risks significantly and they're, and they're willing to accept that risk, uh, then they can do that. So it's, it's not required to um, adhere strictly to these operating conditions. These are just recommended ones that we've provided. Um, so some examples of the operating conditions that have been included uh, and again, these are for use on those narrow roads where the uh, VPD or EADT is less than 75. Um, so examples, uh, when traveling at night, the heavy vehicle must travel at a maximum speed of 40 kilometers per hour and display an amber flashing warning light in the prior mover. Um, so that's one example of an operating condition that could be applied in this situation. Um, and that's mainly just to warn oncoming vehicles or even vehicles coming from behind that there is a vehicle um, ahead. Um, other conditions include the use of warning signage, which we've included a few different types in the guide itself. 
Um, and like I said, local governments can uh, use other operating conditions that may not be included in this guide here. So I know that was a, a lot of content to, uh, that I just kind of rushed through a little bit there. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of, well, I suppose fortunately, there is a lot of content in the guide itself, but it does make it hard to go through every single thing in great detail. Um, however, I, I will just open up for some questions now. Um, and we do have a couple of different question, time, uh, question spots throughout the slide. So uh, feel free to put questions in whenever and um, yeah, we'll, we'll try and answer as many as we can. Perfect, uh, thanks Karen. Yeah, we've got a question from Carmen and they have asked, is the speed limit at the top of the tables, the posted limit or the speed that, it, that is typically done in the location? Yeah, so I believe this is the operating speed. So whatever this speed is that vehicles are actually operating at. Um, and I'll just throw it to Dave just to confirm that. Um, Dave, uh, that, that is correct, right? Yeah, that's right, Karen. Um, yeah. So there's this, there's a, there is a section that, that introduces um, operating speed um, within the guide. And it's really in recognition that um, in some of the, on some of the roads with constrained geometry, whether that be formation width or horizontal and vertical geometry, um, it's, it's recommending that uh, if you don't have uh, in-field data that's measured, uh, measuring operating speeds, um, then you can undertake an operating speed model. Uh, and there's, there's guidance in the Osroads Guide to Road Design Part 3 um, of how you can estimate what the 85th percentile operating speed would be. And then you would, uh, you would use that value um, for that particular section of the road that you're looking at. So to put that in context, if you were looking at lane width uh, along a road that had a section of mountainous terrain, uh, and the whole entire length of the road was posted at 80 k's per hour, it may well be that in some of those constrained areas, you, you're assessing with an operating speed, um, potentially uh, that's lower than 80 k's per hour. So it could be in that 60 to 70 kilometer per hour range, um, but you would have to document um, how you've and why you've made those decisions. Awesome, thanks Dave. Uh, Isabella, any other questions? Yeah, we have a question from Kira and they have asked, is the low speed referred to for access to rural roads the gazetted speed or a conditional speed that can be applied to the vehicle? Um, Dave, I, I'm not sure I understand that completely. Yeah, so um, um, I, I think that one's referring to if you um, put operating conditions um, for access. Um, so, for example, if you identify that certain attributes uh, are met. Um, by using a lower speed, um, well then, yeah, it's 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 an operating speed as part of that condition of access, um, not changing the posted speed limit. Although, if there was if there was grounds to to change the posted speed limit after a speed limit review had been done, um, or you identify that um, even if you um, stipulate a lower operating speed uh, and you have a low level of um, I guess confidence in that operator adhering to that speed. Well, then it may be a case of reducing the speed, but obviously you'd have to think about um, what effect that might have on, on the other road users as well. Thank you. And we have another question from Paul and they have asked, do you have some guidance for curved sections of road? Uh, yeah, so there is curved section, oh, there is guidance for curved sections of road and that's actually coming up shortly in the, um, in the webinar. So we'll be talking about horizontal alignments. Um, so it's not too far away. Um, so stay tuned for that. Perfect, thanks, Kieran. Uh, we currently don't have any more questions, so let's keep going. All right, perfect. All right, so um, the next section that we're gonna be looking at is uh, formation width over structures, uh, which, which is a bit of a critical attribute uh, that does need to be considered. Um, so as we all know, you know, once a bridge is built, it is incredibly hard to change the formation width um, later on. So retroactively going and trying to increase the formation width on a bridge is, in, is impossible in a lot of cases or very, very difficult um, if it is. Um, so structures typically have narrower widths than the roads around them. Um, 
and they're typically more restrictive movement wise, making them a bit of a higher risk um, for heavy vehicles. Uh, so in the guidelines, we have split the guidance for bridges into undivided and divided. Um, and we've also provided guidance for lower order roads or lower order bridges um, with AADT ranges of less than 75 and 75 to 150. Um, and the new guidance is, in some cases, is also contingent on the available site distance um, to the bridge as well. So if there are extremely narrow widths, um, if they do have sufficient site distance uh, beyond the bridge, uh, then they could be like acceptable risks. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, so again, this is just a quick example of, of how to assess the formation width of um, undivided structures. So we're going to look at undivided and also uh, divided um, using the guideline. Uh, so again, we're just going to use some sample data shown in the bottom left there. Um, and using this data, we can assess to find our recommended carriageway widths. Um, so in this case, uh, as I said, we've got an undivided single lane bridge here. Um, we've got adequate site distance, so we can kind of see down and around the corner there. Um, and the AADT for this road is uh, 150 to 500. So when we look at the table on the right there, we can see that the the formation width that would be acceptable is 5.8 meters. And um, in, in the event that we didn't have that sufficient um, safe stopping, uh, safe site distance, um, then we can see that the acceptable width of the bridge actually um, increases. So it would actually go up to 7.2 meters. Um, so it does really depend on what level of site distance is available to these bridges or past these bridges in a lot of cases. And again, um, same thing just with uh, the divided bridges. So there, there is that separate guidance for both of these. Um, and here, this uh, with divided bridges, in some cases, it actually de uh, depends on the length of the bridge itself as to what uh, widths are acceptable or not. Um, so in this case, we've got a bridge where the length is greater than 20 meters and we've got an adequate um, SSD uh, and our AADT is greater than 2000. Uh, so we can see on the table on the right that our recommended formation width is nine meters. And again, um, if, if you're doing a route assessment and the formation widths on these structures do not meet the recommended guidance, then there is always the case of using mitigation treatments or using that route assessment process. And we'll look at some of the uh, additional assessment or mitigating treatments that we can do here. Um, so this additional guidance uh, is specifically for narrow widths over structures on lower volume rural roads. Uh, so this is for any, any rural roads that are less than 150 VPD or AADT. Um, and we've provided a bit of additional guidance on what you can do in those situations. Um, so it's mainly contingent on the site distance uh, around the bridge and additional signage can be erected to provide advanced warning and, and mitigate the risk of narrower bridges or narrow width bridges. Um, so you can see there on the right, we've got a couple of images. Uh, so the top right one that is looking at the site distance around those bridges. Um, and it just kind of goes to explain how to determine if there is adequate site distance or not. Um, so you can see we've got good, medium and poor, each one showing that um, you know, in, in the first one, you know, there is great sight distance. You can see around that corner where the bridge is. In the second one, you can see it to some degree, but it is obscured by some uh, vegetation. And in the third one, there just really isn't enough sight distance um, from both sides. Uh, and then on the bottom there, we've also got some of the um, warning signs that we've put into the guide around what you can use to mitigate this risk. Um, 
So there is, there is the need to consider the sight lines to the structure. And if, um, if the widths don't meet the recommendations, then you can use these mitigating treatments to, um, to provide additional warning and change the level of risk for that. And you can see there on the bottom, there's, there's a few signages that you can use around those bridges. So narrow bridge, reduce speed, one lane bridge, reduce speed, et cetera. So that's, that's pretty much the end of the, um, of the formation width on straight sections of road kind of side of it. Um, so the next section, um, we'll mainly be looking at the, the horizontal alignment and that's more discussing, um, I guess, uh, curvature of the road and also super elevation of the road. Um, in the guidance, there is additional guidance around um, increasing lane widths based on curves. However, that's, um, I guess that guidance has already been around for, for quite some time and there wasn't um, any uh, major changes to that side of it. Um, so we haven't included that in this. Um, so the the curvature stuff that we're looking at is more around uh, the actual curve of the road, sight distance around that curve, and then also uh, super elevation on that on that curve. All right. Um, so the horizontal alignment section, like I said, looks at curves and super elevation. Um, and new guidance has been provided in each of these sections regarding heavy vehicle rollover risk um, and what to do when exceeding the recommended values. Uh, so the guideline has some new guidance regarding um, yes, uh, heavy vehicle rollover risk and it provides advice on the geometric requirements for heavy vehicles to maintain stability on those curves. Um, so it does look at the requirements um, in that respect. Um, and, and it does provide guidance for both sealed and unsealed roads. Um, so I think that's something that's, that's new to compared to a lot of other guides around. And um, the guideline does provide recommendations for both the, the maximum and the minimum curve super elevation. So it, on this slide here, this is mainly looking at the super elevation around a curve. Um, so on the right there, it's basically just um, where, what type of road surface you've got, so sealed or unsealed, the operating speed, um, whether it's a rural or urban road, and then also a little around how many vehicles. Um, so that's kind of how you can determine what your maximum values of super elevation should be. Um, we don't recommend really exceeding these guides, uh, exceeding the, these recommendations in the guide. Um, it is possible to do so as long as you understand the risk and you know, there is that um, mitigating treatments put in place. Um, so it definitely is possible to exceed these, but not really recommended. Uh, so this one here is more looking at the minimum uh, curve radius uh, that's that's available for a curve. Um, so the guide provides desirable and absolute values for minimum curve radius. And uh, these are applicable for pretty much all heavy vehicle types. So it's not actually broken down into different um, vehicle types like some of the other tables. Um, it's all used for the same, uh, for, for all vehicles. Um, so on sealed roads, a curve should be assessed against the desirable minimum curve radius first. And then if the curve radius is smaller than the desirable, then it can be checked against the absolute minimum. Um, there are these two tables on the right that kind of do uh, demonstrate that a little bit. Um, obviously, you, you want to try and aim for the desirable um, radius, but uh, Obviously, we all know that in some situations, it's just not possible to, to achieve that. Um, and in both tables, uh, you can see that there is some shading going on in there. Um, so values which pose a risk of a rollover at um, low speeds are shaded in that orange color. Um, and values which pose a risk at high speed are again shaded in red. Uh, so it does kind of give you an idea on, you know, where you should be sitting within that. 
Um, and then again, like I said, we've got that guidance for unsealed roads as well. Um, so these are simply the, the minimum curve values. Um, it doesn't have desirable absolute, it's just got a minimum value that we recommend you don't exceed. Um, and they should be considered as indicative only for dry roads in good condition. Um, so obviously unsealed roads, they change uh, conditions based on weather, uh, how many vehicles are using it, that kind of stuff. Um, I think I say that in the second dot point actually. So yeah, uh, changes in unsealed road conditions such as potholes, rutting, delamination, surface gravel, uh, even rain um, conditions are likely to influence the uh, vehicle stability. Um, so it could result in different rates of side friction, uh, which would result in larger curve radii being required. Uh, so these can do, oh, these values should only be used, um, yeah, for dry conditions, I suppose. And uh, this is the last slide before we go on to some questions. Um, so this is looking at operating speed reductions when entering curves and horizontal curve perception sight distance. So I think this is something that hasn't really been um, addressed very well in the past. Uh, so drivers on high speed roads should be able to clearly identify um, a curve when they're approaching it, uh, what direction that curve is going, and then also what the radius of that curve is. Uh, so they should be able to identify that and then reduce their speed to, um, to traverse that curve appropriately. Um, so speed reductions from the operating speed to the approach speed um, and then to the curve operating speed should not be more than 10 kilometers per hour. And we've got a little bit of an example of that on the right there. Um, so the very first, well, let's look at the undesirable one first. So uh, the one on the right there, so this is undesirable speed difference. Um, so the approach speed is 90 kilometers per hour. Um, and this is this is using like an operating speed where the poster speed is actually 80. Um, and then the curve operating speed is up to 70 kilometers per hour. So the estimated approach speed subtract the curve operating speed comes out as 20 kilometers per hour. So that's actually exceeding that 10 kilometer recommendation. Um, so that's what we kind of call an undesirable curve. Um, and then the desirable one on the left there, so this is uh, the speed difference less than 10 kilometers per hour. Um, so in this case, the approach speed is 90 kilometers, uh, 90 kilometers an hour again, but the curve operating speed is up to 85 kilometers per hour. So it's only resulting in a, in a difference between, of five kilometers per hour. Uh, so we classify that as desirable. And um, you'll see in a lot of the uh, tables that there is kind of this um, differentiation in horizontal alignment where it's uh, substandard curves, which require different um, curve radii to be looked at. Uh, I believe we've got an example of that coming up. I can't remember if I touch on that actually. Um, so we'll find out soon enough. All right, so I'll just open up for some questions before we start moving into um, the two examples that we've got lined up. And these examples will kind of go over some of the content we've looked at today, and then also look at some of that risk, uh, risk assessment uh, process that we looked at last week. Uh, Isabella, any, any questions that have come through? Thanks, Kieran. Yeah, we have one question that's come through and that is from Jeff and they've asked, with better access to quality aerial photography, what are your thoughts about using tracking type software like spider path or auto turn to determine sections of a road that may be deficient before going into a detailed assessment using the manual? Yeah, so it really depends on what you're using the aerial photos for. Like if you're using them for something like a swept path, um, or low speed sweat path assessment. Um, yeah, that's something that's been done in the past um, using aerial photography rather than uh, the actual AutoCAD drawing or design drawings. Um, you just need to kind of allow for a margin of error there. I think the, I think using something like near maps has a bit of a, I think it's like a half a meter error ratio. 
Um, for other types of assessment, uh, I'd probably have to ask Dave on, on his thoughts on what other assessments you can really use the aerial uh, photography for. Yeah, sure, Karen. Um, look, I, I might provide an answer and then, and then um, hand over to Larry to get get a perspective from uh, from a road authority's um, standpoint. But yeah, look, certainly the the guide is intended to so as you can um, complete a, a desktop assessment, um, particularly with the geometric components, as, as much as possible. And as Karen mentioned, yeah, there's just a recognition there that there's there is a margin of error using aerial. Um, imagery and you would just um, document that that in your assessment. So um, with regards to some of the, the guidance that Karen showed for assessing horizontal curvature um, for high speed manoeuvres, um, yeah, you, yes, you can certainly um, pull out a curve radii um, from aerial imagery and it's just a matter of, of doing a plus or minus rationale check where, where you might identify the curves 200 metre radius and you might have a look at it at a slightly smaller um, curve radio and just see what the difference is um, in, in, in how that uh, complies with with uh, the guidance provided in, in this guide and really just document document your decision. Um, Larry, what uh, what sort of uh, comments do you think you could provide if someone had took that approach and provided it to um, for a for a state controlled road? Well look you, you take a step back and say, why are you actually performing the assessment? Are you performing the assessment to, with a view towards uh, granting a permit? Or are you uh, conducting the assessment because you, you, you really want to find out what you need to do to improve the safety of the road or its ability to handle um, heavy or multi-combination vehicles? If it is uh, just to provide an assessment, then, then you definitely you, uh, um, whether you're going to provide the uh, uh, the assessment for the purposes of providing a, a permit, uh, then you would look at the the pinch points. You don't really need to go into it all that uh, all that deeply. Look at the uh, the pinch points, the uh, where the road is too narrow, where the conditions are too bad, and. and and assess those first. And if it, if they come up as no, well then you, then you have your answer. On the other hand, uh, if you are going to look at uh, assessing it for what improvements do I need to make, well then you're going to have to do the full assessment, going along the whole road and looking at all pinch points, and, and making your decision based on that. Yeah, thanks, Larry. I, I think, hope I think that was that clear does, enough. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, does uh, also to identify the the dual purpose um, of the guide as well. So, obviously, um, if if you are looking to um, put together, a, if you're looking to provide gazetted access on a road, for example, you might want to um, do a more thorough investigation and, and put together a program of works. Um, and if you're looking for uh, you know, you, you feel as though you're only going to have two or three vehicles running on a permit, um, then perhaps, yeah, as, as Larry mentioned, you can um, have a look at it uh, with that lens also. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, that, Larry. Uh, I'll hand back to you, Karen. Okay. Yep, no worries. And I guess I'll hand back to Isabella and ask if she has any more questions or if any of the audience members have any questions. Hey, Karen, we don't have any more questions at the moment, uh, so let's keep going. All right, perfect. All right, so uh, the last bit of this uh, session will be just looking at some examples on how to apply what we've uh, gone through to an actual route assessment. Um, so the two, the two examples that we've got are formation widths on unsealed ro rural roads and formation widths over a structure. All right, so. Uh, the first example we've got is uh, yeah, formation on a unsealed road that's in a bit of a rural area. Um, so it'll be looking at um, the assessment of the actual formation width, then additional considerations if the requirements, if the required widths are not met, um, considerations for low volume, low speed roads, Condition, uh, consideration for narrow sections with low volume roads, and then also operating conditions for those, 
um, and then mitigating measures uh, to ensure safety. Uh, so in this example, we're going to be assessing for a B double vehicle access on uh, two sections of an unsealed road. Um, so we're assuming that this road is currently only accessible for general access vehicles. Uh, so I guess the first question is, uh, how, do, how do we assess this? Uh, what happens if it does not meet the values and the guidelines? And then how do we grant access using a risk assessment? Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about in here. Uh, so the first step in that is really just identifying what the recommended guidance is uh, for your carriageway width. Um, so obviously we want to assess against the relevant table in the guideline, in this case, uh, table 10.4. Um, and again, we've got our data that we need on the left there. Um, so vehicle is B double, uh, carriageway width that we've measured is seven meters. Um, our operating speed is 60 kilometers per hour and our AADT is 60. Um, so once we plug that data into that table, um, it comes out and says that the recommended carriageway width is 7.6 meters. Uh, so obviously that does not, well, our measured carriageway width does not meet the recommended width of 7.6. Um, so then I guess our next step is to look at some of the other tables that are available in the guide. Um, so one of the other tables is, well, one of the other sections is looking at uh, rural roads where it does have a low volume or low speed. Um, so in this case, it's uh, less than 75 BPD or AADT, and the speed is less than 60 kilometers per hour. Um, so this is one of the tables that we looked at earlier, so table 10.5 from the guide. Um, so we're still using the same values from before. However, we now need to start looking at um, our SSD, so our safe stopping distance. Um, and we need to work out if we have enough sight distance to be able to actually um, use this. So if we just flip back to this, um, so we can clearly see that, you know, you can see down the road, you can easily see if a vehicle is coming. Um, there's little vegetation in the way. Uh, so we definitely have 250 meters of uh, sight distance there. So because of that, we can use the uh, carriageway width with uh, SSD greater than 250 meters. Um, and when we plug the other values back in, uh, we come up with a recommended width of 6.1 meters. So that, that actually does, uh, well, our carriageway that we've measured does actually um, exceed those, uh, that value. Um, so that's kind of a, a pass now. So the second part of our route that we're looking at is a very narrow section. So what happens if there are extremely narrow sections of road? Well, the guideline provides additional guidance for small lengths of narrow sections, um, as long as the AADT is less than 150. Um, so this is used to mitigate the risk of those very narrow sections. And we did look at this a little bit earlier. Um, so on the right there, you'll see that same table. Um, it basically just measures uh, off of the traffic volume that is, uh, is on that route segment. Um, and in this case, our ADT was 60. So we can use that first row of the table. Uh, and that basically just tells us that the, the width requirement is that it not be less than 3.5 meters. Um, and our maximum length of narrow section can only be 100 meters. Um, there are a few other um, criteria there as well that we need to meet. Um, the only other one that we're really going to focus on in this example is just the site distance, um, so 150 metres. Uh, so if we flip back to that previous photo, we can see, uh, I know it's not the greatest quality, but we can see that there is enough site distance available there. And the section that is narrow is only a very short section. Um, so we meet both of those criteria. Uh, so because of that, it basically just means that the risk is very minimal and we are able to use a 
road that is not less than 3.5 meters. So our carriageway width of five meters exceeds that, which is fantastic. Um, so it means that that road route section passes and we have no issues providing access for that. So when applying provisions for narrow sections of roads, uh, the operating conditions from section 10.4 of the guide um, may also be required. So we did touch on this a bit before. Um, so table 10.7 and the operating conditions from 10.4 assist in the mitigation of risk on narrow sections of roads. Um, so we can simply apply whatever conditions we feel will be most beneficial and um, decrease the level of risk in these uh, situations. So for this road, we're going to say that headlights must be switched on at all times. And when traveling at night, uh, the vehicle must travel at a reduced speed and display an amber flashing warning light. Um, so that should alert any oncoming vehicles. Um, so both in the day and at night, that there is a heavy vehicle coming. And that's how we mitigate that risk of um, having that reduced narrow width. So what happens when a road section does not meet the recommended guidance and you can't apply those other, um, those other narrow width tables? Um, so we can actually use a risk assessment process uh, to mitigate or to identify risks and then mitigate the risk. Um, so using our, our example from earlier, so this road on the right here, uh, let's see what happens if we had the following parameters instead. So um, our operating speed is still 60 kilometers per hour, but our AADT on that road is now 200. So first of all, you know, we just double check the, uh, the table again. Uh, so this is the same slide that we had earlier. So um, again, the guide is recommending us to have a carriageway width of 7.6 meters, which is uh, greater than our measured carriageway width of seven meters. Um, so we're not actually able to use any of the additional tables that we looked at before because our AADT is so high. Um, so we're gonna move on to doing an actual risk assessment process. So we can use this process to identify any risks that may occur um, because of giving access uh, to this vehicle. And then we can also mitigate those risks to allow that access. Um, so we've already identified one risk in the table on the top right there. Um, so it's a road geometry consideration. Uh, the safety hazard is unsafe road, uh, unsafe, uh, sorry, unsafe road width on a rural unsealed road. And the description of that is just saying that it increases the risk of head-on collision or runoff road incidents. Uh, so when we look at the risk analysis and tricks on the bottom there, um, we can identify what the likelihood of that incident occurring is, and then also the severity. Um, so the likelihood would be rather unlikely. It's, it's still quite a low uh, AADT um, and there is a lot of sight distance in that area. Uh, however, the severity would be major, even though it is still traveling at a low speed, um, it is still enough to, to do quite significant injury if there is an event that occurs. Um, so we end up with a moderate uh, risk store, uh, risk rating. Um, so again, yeah, uh, moderate risk rating, uh, the risk evaluation model recommends risk mitigation by changing the likelihood or changing the consequences. Um, so again, this is, this is some tables that we did um, go over in session two of the webinar. So hopefully everyone was able to see that. Otherwise, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have that up on the website at some point so that everyone can check it out. Um, but yeah, so that's just a table from the ISO 31000, um, which details the risk evaluation model to determine what treatment approaches and options should be used. Um, 
obviously uh, we, we need to abide by the principles of risk assessment. Um, so if there were more than one risk, we should prioritize the most severe risks first, um, balance the costs, involve relevant stakeholders, and be careful of any secondary risks caused by any treatments that are implemented. Um, so on the bottom right there, we've actually got our, um, our treatments that we've come up with. Uh, and in this example, we've come up with three different types. So we've got speed, signage, and infrastructure. Um, and then we've got a, an estimate of what the cost would be to implement those. Um, so if we were to add conditions to a, a permit or a notice that limits vehicles as a condition of access, that would be a relative low cost. Um, erecting signage, uh, warning drivers of narrow roads and heavy vehicle activity is a bit more moderate. And then uh, changing the formation width to accommodate larger vehicles, well, that's very high. Um, so if we look at those three approaches um, in this next table, we can kind of see what the outcomes would be of that. Um, so again, our safety hazard is the unsafe road with on rural unsealed roads. Um, our three treatments, and then the new risk rating that we have instead of the old moderate. Um, so in two of those cases, the likelihood or that the risk rating has now become low while one has stayed as moderate. And then from there, it's basically just balancing the cost to work out which one you would, you would choose. Um, so I am a little bit conscious of time, so I might just skip this question section um, and move on to the second example. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to answer one or two questions at the end. Um, so the second example is um, a bit similar to the first one. So it is looking at formation width over structures um, and additional considerations if the required width is not met and then considerations for narrow widths on lower volume rural roads. Um, so as we mentioned before, the structural width is typically, typically lower than uh, the, the road width that's connecting to it. Um, and there are limited options for avoiding a, you know, a head-on collision when on a structure. Um, so the consequences for narrow widths over a structure can be more severe. Um, like I said before, it could end up in a head-on collision or um, entering a ravine or a rail underpass, anything like that. Um, sight lines should be available to the structure and to vehicles approaching from the opposite direction. And um, warning signage should be provided on a structure approach to identify narrow structure widths to drivers. So I guess the first step of us actually doing this assessment, and this is still using some very similar um, values from the last example. Um, so the first thing we wanna do is assess against table 10.10 .10 of the guide. So this is undivided carriageways uh, or undivided bridges. Um, so once we plug in those values on the left there, uh, we can work out what our recommended um, bridge width is. So in this case, the rec recommended bridge width is 5.3 meters. Um, so our carriageway width that we've measured uh, doesn't quite meet this. So in this instance, the additional provisions in section 10.6.1 um, can be used as the AADT is less than 150. Um, so this basically just provides additional criteria that you can use um, if you are on a low volume road. Um, and I guess in the end, this section essentially uses a risk assessment to grant access. So it's, it's providing mitigating treatments to, um, to a risk that's been identified. Uh, and it mitigates that through the use of uh, warning signs. And um, yeah, signage can typically be applied for, for speed or uh, sight distance issues. Um, so we can either have one that says reduce speed or just warns people that there is a bridge coming up, um, either way. Uh, and again, we've got that table on the bottom right there, which just shows how to work out um, how much site distance is available and I guess what level of uh, quality that site distance is.
Um, so if the AADT was greater than 150, um, a road manager could consider providing uh, mitigating treatments such as signage. Uh, the level of signage would be dependent on the sight lines to the structure and between opposing vehicles approaching the structure. Um, and if the road manager was to accept signage as a mitigating treatment or mitigating measure, um, the resulting risk would need to be documented using the risk assessment process. Um, so what that means is you can still use this signage, but you do have to go through that risk assessment process that we looked at earlier. Um, so as the narrow lane width provisions don't apply because the AADT is over 150, uh, we can use the risk assessment process. Um, so this is very similar to the last example. So we've got our risk identified there in the top right. Um, and then we've also got our severity of the, um, or our risk rating uh, of the event based on severity and likelihood. And uh, again, it's, it's moderate. Um, so because it's moderate, we basically just want to change the likelihood or the consequences of that occurring. Um, and again, like we mentioned before, uh, we should follow those principles of the of, of treating a, a, a risk that are identified in our previous sessions. Um, so balancing costs involving relevant stakeholders, um, identifying secondary risks, uh, and prioritizing more severe risks first. Um, so again, we've we've got very similar treatments to the to the previous one. Um, uh, treating it through speed reductions, uh, through signage, or through infrastructure changes. Um, and again, it's it's very similar to the last example where um, it's basically balancing the costs of that versus the uh, reduction of risk. Um, so in this case, you know, you could even use a combination of two. So you could put speed uh, reductions in and then also use signage to really reduce that risk to a very low um, rating. But, yeah. uh, so that pretty much brings us to the end of this session. Um, so I'll, I'll just open up for maybe one or two questions. I know we've uh, pretty much hit 12 o'clock, um, but yeah. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, yeah, we've probably got time for one question and that is from Adam and they have asked, what about the flooding risk and damage to structure, bridges and roads? Yeah, um, I guess that's that's something that uh, I think is considered in the structural section of um, of the report. But I, yeah, I'm not too sure how to answer that, so I may have to pass that on to Dave. Yeah, sure. Um, look, I think uh, just trying to unpack the question a little bit. Um, I think uh, what uh, what we're really getting at here is um, is is the structure that we're providing access on subject to flooding. Um, and if a heavy vehicle is given access um, over that structure and a flooding event does occur, is there a uh, essentially a, a backup plan um, in place? So I think that's something that, um, that you, you need to mention. Um, it is mentioned in the guide. It's highlighted as one of the um, tick box items in the checklist at the end of the guide, um, which specifically says, uh, if, if the route contains section subjects to flooding or is crossing a flyway, have details and alternative routes been assessed using road width criteria as per sections 10.44 and 10.45. So if, if you know that there's a, a, a section, a floodway or a structure that's subject to flooding, um, you should uh, assess alternative routes. Um, uh, with regards to yeah, the structure being subject to flood damage and whether providing heavy vehicles over that structure um, might increase the risk of a failure after a flood event. Um, yeah, I think we can we can try and cover that in uh, ongoing webinars where we talk about structural assessments. Um, Larry, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, David, I think you've covered that um, quite clearly. Hmm. Okay. Um, right. Although, although the, um, just from the point of view of um, structures, uh, sorry, floods affecting the structural integrity of bridges, yes, this this would have to be um, assessed uh, after the fact. 
absolutely. Yep, awesome. Thanks, Thanks for that, Dave and Larry. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, we, so we have hit after 12, so I think we will um, wrap this up. If you could go to the next slide, please. Yep. Perfect. So thank you to our presenters today and thanks to the audience for tuning in. Our next NACO webinar is the 30th of July, so tomorrow. Uh, please check out our website. We have so much happening in the online space and we'd love to have you join us with anything that might enhance your professional development and build your CPD points. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Isabella. And again, yeah, I just want to thank Dave and Larry for attending and uh, providing some fantastic uh, responses to some of those questions. Thanks, thank Karen, and, and thanks for everyone thank um, tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. See you tomorrow.